Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. When we read this passage, we read that it happened shortly after Elijah had given up the ghost, after, after he died. Elisha died in verse 20, and they buried him. Now the bands of Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year, and they were burying a man. Behold, they saw a marauding band, and they cast the man into the grave of Elijah, Elisha. And when the man touched or made contact with the bones of Elisha, he re revived and stood on his feet. Now Haziel, king of Aram, had oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence until now. When Hazael, the king of Aram, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoaz, the son of uh, Jehoahaz took him from the land of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, and the cities which he had taken in war from the hand of Jehoaz, his father. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. This was shortly following the death of Elisha. It was not long afterwards. We don't know how long, but obviously he had not been long deceased. Now, we do know that in the times of Jesus, it was believed that the Shekinah hovered over the death of a righteous man for up to four days. For the first three days, on the fourth day, it would, it would depart, or he would depart. That is the significance of, of Lazarus' resurrection, for instance, um, where it said he'd, he'd been dead four days. It meant that he was completely defunct, and there was no more spiritual life even associated with his corpse. Well... That was the background of Jewish thought at that particular time. It was a resurrection miracle. Now, the Old Testament is always a type of Christ. It was always a type of Christ, everything that happened. When you see a resurrection narrative or, or miraculous narrative involving resurrection in the Old Testament, it is a picture of the type of Jesus. What it means is, through his death and resurrection, we have life. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, that we have life. It's, a, it's an Old Testament type. Now, no place, no place was such fetishism as, relative, as relics ever practiced anywhere in the early church or in Judaism. Neither was grave soaking. The idea of laying on a grave and trying to get the anointing from a dead person is ridiculous. This is a one-time miracle that God allowed as a sign that prefigured the death of Christ and resurrection of Christ and so forth and the, and the eternal life that believers will have through Jesus' death we will come out alive. But it was again at that time a sign that despite the sin of the people, God would not give them over to their enemies. He would allow them to go through the consequences of their action, but he would bring them back to life. And <coughs> it was testified to in the days of Jehoash the king. That's what it meant. No place do you ever see people soaking on top of graves or laying on top of graves trying to get an anointing. We had two major figures in the evangelical church supposedly claiming to be saved Christians, who were into this kind of practice. One was a sexually immoral man, the late Earl Park. He actually claimed that when his sister Joan died, there was a Christian version of seances. He claimed that he said to the Lord, well, I know seances are of the occult, 
but there must be a Christian version since the occult always counterfeits the truth. Notice what Paul did. He did not begin with the truth to define error. He began with an error to define truth. This is the sin of necromancy. Another is Benny Hinn, when he would say he would go to Forest Lawn Cemetery near Los Angeles and get the anointing from the graves of Catherine Coleman and so forth and Amy McPherson. This is absolute necromancy. This is not what is happening here. There was no effort to communicate with the dead. There was no effort to derive any spiritual power from communicating with the dead. It was a miracle God did at that time, showing that the message Elisha preached, which foreshadowed the message of the Messiah, was a life-giving message and would restore life from the dead. That's all it meant. No place did Israel or the church ever derive any such practices as fetishism, as relics, or as grave soaking. It's just not in there. That is no basis for anything. You can say all kinds of things. You can try to make anything a basis of a doctrine. There were some crazy people in Britain, or well, they were spiritually crazy, during the Toronto deception. And they took a verse in the book of, of, of uh, Jeremiah, when I behold thy word, I tremble. And they were on the floor vibrating violently, having conniptions, saying that that was the fulfillment of the verse. Anybody can take a verse or passage out of context and make something out of it that the scriptures do not teach. This is not a basis for grave soaking or for necromancy or for any kind of relics or fetishism. It simply is not. Now what's also interesting is the people who were associated with this, living and dead, Earl Polk, sexually immoral, Benny Hinn, caught walking hand in hand while still married to his wife Susan with Paula White on a Via Venuto in Rome. Uh, Amy Simple McPherson, again, serious moral issues. And then Catherine Coleman. Catherine Coleman went, ran off with the husband of another woman. She actually ran off with the husband of another woman as a Christian. All of them had serious, serious moral issues. To look to people like that as some kind of a role model in itself is highly problematic.